Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to day one of the Free Expression Festival, a series of programs leading up to Thursday's Free Expression Awards, an annual event where the Freedom Forum recognizes individuals for their courageous acts of free and fearless expression. The festival features honorees, presenters, and guest speakers talking about the importance of the First Amendment in their work. Today, we feature Miami Herald humor columnist, Dave Barry, who discusses his career, the art of humor writing, and how the First Amendment protects comedy and satire. On Thursday, Dave is presenting the Free Expression Power Shift Award to his colleague, investigative reporter, Julie K. Brown, who is being recognized for her series of investigative reports on Jeffrey Epstein. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. Today's festival program was also made possible with generous support from the Reef Team, TTR Sotheby's International Realty. And now, please welcome our moderator, Washington Post columnist, Alexandra Petri. Hello, I'm Alexandra Petri, hey. a columnist for the Washington Post, and welcome to the Freedom Forum's Free Expression Festival. Hello, Dave. Hey, thank you for, for doing this. Oh, I thank you a, for- I'm a fan of yours. Oh, it's entirely mutual. Uh, yeah. So how have you been, I, today I am pleased to welcome best-selling author and humorist Dave Barry for a discussion on his career and how he continues his work during these turbulent times in which we face some very serious challenges. We'll also talk to him about the power of the First Amendment and how it allows him to do his style of satire and parody without fear of being silenced. So for many years, for those of you who don't know, and I assume you're not legion, uh, Dave wrote a newspaper column that appeared in more than 500 newspapers, and in 1988, he won the Pulitzer Prize for commentary. Uh, one of Barry's columns was largely responsible for the movement to in observe International Talk Like a Pirate Day every year on September 19th. Dave has written more than 30 books, including the novels Big Trouble, Lunatics, Tricky Business, Insane City, and most recently, Lessons from Lucy, The Simple Joys of an Old Happy Dog. And now I'm supposed to welcome you. So welcome again. Yeah. Yeah, I, that was really awkward there. From So I will take back that beginning when I said that I'm a big fan. I'll say it now. I'm a big fan. Thank you for doing this. This is an honor for me. Oh, it's an honor for me as well. And uh, now that we've gotten through the awkward reading of your accolades, which could have gone on for a whole 20 minutes. So how have you been dealing with quarantine? What are you located right now? Oh, I'm in, I'm at home, but this is where I am anyway, all the time. Even when we're not having quarantine, I'm pretty much here in this office. Um, so it hasn't, I mean, it hasn't been bad for me. I don't have any place to go to. I mean, it's pathetic to say that, but that's the truth, that's the <laughs> truth, so. No, I mean, as a fellow work from home person, it was initially, well, oh, so I just get to not have to go to the office or feel bad about not going to the office. But now that it's been like a full year that I couldn't physically possibly go to the office, I'm starting to be like, I yearn for the joys of the office water cooler and the lottery <laughs> of the cubicles. Are you feeling any of that? Are you like, no, there, there was never any yearning? No, I mean, not really. I, I got to say, I be, um, I'm very old. I'm thousands of years old. I have, and I actually have worked in offices over the years, and I don't really miss that at all. Um, but I've never worked in an office that had a water cooler, and I'm I'm wondering if, if maybe that's the problem. If, if you know, we should bring that back. I would go if there were, like you know, the Miami Herald, which is technically my employer. Their office is somewhere in Miami. I, I have not been there in a long time. But if they had a water cooler there. I would go, I think, and stand around it just to see what it was be a new thing for me. Um, yeah, no, because people talk really so strongly I'm... about these water coolers and all the hubbub there. I, I think we have a water cooler, but I don't think we have one that has those little conical cups that I feel like are essential to the water cooler experience. That, and but... why is it called? This is not really the point of this interview because we want to get to the First Amendment. That's really right, a very important amendment, and we're 
We're both 110% in favor of the First Amendment, which gives us the right to say anything, including 110%. But why do they call it a water cooler when the, the thing is, the point of it isn't really that the water is cooled by it. Really, the point of it is it has water. There's water there. Like you might as well call a water fountain a water cooler, yeah. but that isn't the point of the water fountain either. It's to get water out of it. So to me, uh, to you me, know, I just think when we do, go ahead. I, I think about the water cooler. I feel like it was a deliberate choice of word because you want to imply, well, it's not going to be cool, but it's going to be cooler. It's not going to be warm tepid water but it won't be you know they're trying to set your expectations so that when you experience the water cooler you think that this is cooler than it could have been uh i think that's all they're really setting you up I for see. okay so they're basically the point of that name is just make sure you're not standing around here to get lukewarm water you're going to get yeah. cool water you know, we talk, exchange office yeah, no, lukewarm water and, and office gossip feels like an, a subpar attraction in all regards. But I got so, it. yeah, we should. Uh, speaking of lukewarm water and office camaraderie, how did it all? How, so how did you get your start? <laughs> well, no, I, I uh, OK, I, I actually got my journalism start. Well, besides the usual, I worked for my high school newspaper and my college newspaper. Unlike you, so not all of us attended Harvard. I attended <laughs> Haverford, which if you slurred it, sounds a little bit like Harvard, Harvard, Harvard College in Pennsylvania. Our, our motto is, we never heard of you either. Um, but anyway, I wrote, I wrote columns for my high school, Pleasantville High School class of 1965. I wrote I, actually one column for a humor column for my high school newspaper, which was edited by my friend Tom Parker. So it only came out once the whole year because the only reason he was the editor was he wanted to get into Yale, which I know is an, uh, you know, the rival of, of Harvard. But that's where yeah. he went. He went to Yale and he was really, I mean, just shitty newspaper editor, good friend, and wonderful guy. But he only brought out one paper the whole year just so he could get into Yale. And I wrote a column, a humor column for that paper. And then I went to, to Harvard College and um, wrote a number of, uh, of, I was originally the uh, editor there, was a guy named Dennis Stern, who became an editor at the New York Times, um, which is a rival of the Washington Post. There's, there's a lot yeah. of times to you here. And, um, and he would assign me, I went to volunteer for the newspaper and, and he would assign me to do a news story. And instead of doing the news story, I would just go write a humor column about it. So eventually he gave up trying to have me be a, a reporter and just let me write humor columns, which I did. I wrote them all through um, my my years at Haverford College. Um, I thought they were very funny, these columns. Many years later, I was at a, 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 a reunion and they somebody, some really evil person, had blown up my columns from college and put them all around the gym where we had a, a some kind of an event. So I'm looking at these gigantic blown up columns that I wrote when I was in college um, that at the time I thought were just hilarious. And they were just <laughs> so, I didn't, get any, I didn't get any of the jokes at all in them. So I, I highly recommend never, never doing that. Um, so anyway, but anyway, then I, during the summers, I, when I was at uh, college, I worked for Congressional Quarterly in Washington, D.C. as a semi, you know, like an intern, basically. But I did get to write some stuff, but not humor. They're not big on humor at the Congressional Quarterly. Yeah, the Congressional um, Quarterly doesn't exactly ring with delight. <laughs> it's not. No, it's, but, yeah, it's never, never going to be like made into a movie starring Adam Sandler or anything like that. It's just going to be Congressional Quarterly. Um, but anyway, that's so I did that and then got a job at a newspaper in Pennsylvania called the Daily Local News. That's the name of it in Westchester, Pennsylvania. And I, I was a you know beat reporter and I did all the things. I wrote obituaries and fires and police beat and school. But I covered municipal meetings that are still going on there. <laughs> and then but when I could, I wrote a humor column on the side and gradually over the years. I wasn't like you. I was not a prodigy. Nobody said uh, oh, this person's great. Let's hire this person. Uh, it wasn't like that. It was just, you know, 
very slowly, gradually, my column got into more papers. And then um, eventually I got hired by the Miami Herald. Uh, and that's and I've been there ever since. So that's the short version. It took forever, in other words, for me to become a, a humor columnist, unlike some of us. Huh. Um, no, but I, I, I do feel like it is, it's an analogous process where the, uh, people keep trying to get you to write you know, good journalism. And instead, a uh, humor column keeps coming out and you just have years to perfect it. Whereas uh, it, the internet- You, you had a word on the fly. You perfect anything, yeah. Uh, no, but I, I do also yeah. love that it, most people when they say they wrote for their high school paper, they mean papers plural, but you just mean paper singular. There was one paper and that was, that's, I love that. Oh man, so I, I feel like, as somebody who was reading you, I was always amazed because there's so much going on and you're able to find jokes for all of it. So I don't know if this, no one ever likes the question of like humorous. So like, how, how do you boil this frog? What, what's the least funny thing you can say about your profession? But how do you manage to keep making jokes as things continue to happen? Um, well, the jo the stock joke answer I always give to that is because I have no useful skill, but it is kind of true. And since you do exactly the same thing, I think you know what I mean. Um, whereas normal people, not, not like you or me, but a normal person with a real job looks at the world, looks at the news, whatever, and they go, huh. You know, or they might think something is funny. They might think something is stupid. They might think something is horrible. But then they go off and do the actual job that they have, which probably is, you know, something where they can figure out it before they even start what it is they're supposed to do. Whereas you and I, you, you think, well, I have to find some way to turn this into humor. I have to find a joke here. And sometimes that's really easy. Uh, as you know, sometimes it's just, it's almost impossible not to make it. In fact, sometimes, and the last four years gave us lots of examples of this, it's it's almost like you don't have to do anything to make it funny because it's already funny. I mean, if you're looking at it the right way, it's already funny, but some of the time it's not. And then that's where having no useful skill other than writing humor comes in handy. You sit, you sit down and you spend, I don't know about you, but I spend a long time thinking of jokes and how to you know make this this one particular sentence a little bit funnier than a little bit funnier than a little bit funnier and finally okay that's as funny as I I can make it um, and then sometimes saying well I can't actually make a joke about that because it's too offensive or whatever um, but the, the the answer is so boring as you know it isn't really that you're um, just perceiving humor it's not coming to you like radio waves. It's more like you're seeing the same thing everyone else is seeing, but your only job, your only your role in life, your function as a human being is to figure out how to make that seem a little bit funnier to other people, which sometimes just means saying it back to them and not to be um, too funny, but you do this brilliantly when you when you do those parodies of hearings where you just really just almost saying the same thing that they said but you just curate it just right and pick just the right part and maybe tweak it just a tiny bit. And people go, oh yeah, I saw that. And I thought exactly the same thing. And that's really funny. And I, I, I've said this a million times to people who want to le learn how to be funny or how to write humor is most of the time, what really makes people laugh is not something that you thought of that they never would have thought of. I mean, that can happen, but it's very rarely the main, the thing that really gets them. What really gets them is when you say exactly what they thought was funny about it in the first place, but didn't quite, we're in, you know, they didn't, they didn't spend a whole day trying to put your, their finger on it. And that's what you do and I do, you know, and that's what makes it, you know, that makes, that's the way we get paid to do it. Yes, no, I think that's exactly right. I, I feel like people, like to recognize that they weren't alone in thinking something. And so as long as you aren't making exactly the same joke that 100% of the internet is making, it's very reassuring when people think, oh good, I'm not, I'm not nuts for thinking that what I saw was there. It's, it's yeah, it's reassuring. So yeah. I, but you also, in addition to doing columns, you also do books. Uh, so how do you decide, I, I'm gonna, today I'm gonna sit down and do a book. Is it the idea first or what? 
prompts the book. I would say it's the same for me as it was for Shakespeare and Hemingway and all the other great, I signed a contract saying, <laughs> saying that I'm going to write a book and they, and they, it's terrifying. They give you money up front to, you know, so then you really kind of have to write the book because you owe them the book. Um, uh, that's my main motivation. Then I have to figure out a topic, which is what really your question is. Um, and I don't know, I, I wish I had a, uh, a good system for figuring out which topic to pick, which book to write about. Cause sometimes I'll, I'll think this is brilliant. I'll write a book about this. And then I, you know, I discover it really wasn't that it wasn't a book or sometimes I'll actually write the whole book and not that many people will buy it. You know, so I wish that's the part where I'm not as good as Hemingway and Shakespeare. Um, you know, they're better than me at that. Yeah, I, I do love a good sort of, oh, here's a deadline, because if I don't do this, I will fail to complete my contractual obligation. And therefore, I think I mean, if the paper only came out once a year, I would only write once a year, but I have to do it every day. So you do it every day. And that's the yeah, mistake no you made. Not you should be writing for the Pleasantville High School, the Green Quill, I believe it was called. Um, the Green Quill. Once a year. I think it was the green quill. That might have been a yearbook. It was the green something. We were the green and white. Green and white for me forever. That's our yeah. song. Yeah. Well, so going back to the freedom, because I don't want to get too far away from the freedoms uh, that allowed the green quill to flourish <laughs> in its uh, prime. So the Freedom Forms Free Expression Awards is celebrating individuals for their courageous acts of and contributions to free and fearless expression. And you're presenting the award to Julie K. Brown on Thursday for her coverage of the Jeffrey Epstein story. So can you share your thoughts on Julie? Oh, man, I am so glad. This is when we were talking about, like, why why I'm not a real reporter. Um, and I learned early on, I did not have what it takes to be a real reporter. You, you work for the, a great paper. I work for a, a great paper and you see them around you. Um, and Julie's a great reporter and it's the, the common, I mean, people always think about the writing, which is the least important part of being a great reporter. Although she's obviously a great writer, but, um, Julie is fierce. I, the best word I could use to describe fierce and fearless. And she took on. Um, in this particular, the, the, in the Jeffrey Epstein uh, story, you know, a lot of people who really were, you know, we are always talking about, um, the, you know, going against the powerful in our business, really powerful people and um, people who who really needed defending who got really messed over by really powerful people. And there was no incentive on the part of anybody involved to, to let that story come out. And Julie was just relentless, tough. She still is um, scary tough. I would, I'm so glad that Julie K. Brown is not after me for anything as far as I know, um, because I'd be in jail, I'm sure for something by now she were. She is really tough and really, really fierce. Um, and she's what makes journalism. And in, in our case, this in the case of her story, I, it ended up with, you know, everything came out. It came out, it was like a movie, almost better than a movie. Um, the way it came out, the way you always want it to, but it often doesn't in, in journalism. So I don't know. There's, there's nothing I can say about her that hasn't been said a lot, except she, there's a reason she's winning all these awards. She deserves them. Uh, what she did is amazing. Yeah, no, I think it's great to see actual journalists at work while we're typing in our little humorous <laughs> poll. But yeah, and then yeah, when, when the inevitable movie comes out as like the spotlight of, of Julie, we can be the ones saying, you know, it was weird that the costume designer insisted that all the shirts be really rumpled and said that was the best way to ensure journalistic accuracy and, you know, be indignant at, at the appropriate time. But so the ceremony is also a ce celebration of the First Amendment. And what does the First Amendment mean to you uh, in terms of your work <laughs> and just like what you're able to say? I, I love the First Amendment, and um, I have been reminded many times over the years that it's a good thing that they have it, especially if you are a humor writer. Because as you know, um, one of the guarantees, if anybody, and I tell this to young people who want to become columnists of any kind, but particularly if they want to become humor writers, is whatever you write, whatever joke you make, 
somebody's going to be pissed off about it. Somebody's going to, and people are going to hate you, no matter how benign you thought it was and how harmless you thought it was. Um, and they will come after you, um, you know, with varying degrees of effectiveness. But uh, it w- it'd be utterly impossible to be a human writer. And it is in- utterly impossible in other countries, not all of them, but a lot of them, to be a human writer. You can't do it. You're not allowed to do it. You would be immediately imprisoned if you tried to do it. And we don't even think about it. I'll, I remember um, when I first got, not when I first got the, the Herald, the Miami Herald, but I've been there a few years. And our um, uh, lo- our lawyer at the time, I don't know whether he was a staff lawyer or was on the firm that represented this guy named Rick Ovalman, who was a, a really great, I think Harvard educated attorney. And he specialized in First Amendment law. And he gave a big long talk to the assembled Miami Herald staff about libel law and uh, talked about all these lawsuits that have been filed against the Miami Herald for stories and other papers have been filed, you know, what the law was and so on. And when it was over, I went up to him and I said, Rick, how come I never get sued? And he put his arm around me and said, Dave, what makes you think you never get sued? <laughs> and, you know, it just it, it, it turned out, and I don't know if actual if I ever actually got sued, but there were many, many legal threats made against the Miami Herald because of my column, um, and I'm sure other people. And but but you know, he 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 talked about how like one of the absolute case defenses against um, being sued for libel is uh, humor is is a great if you can show it was humor, even if it wasn't even remotely funny, um, you can you 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 can. Uh, defend yourself against uh, libel suits. So anyway, first of all, for the First Amendment, without it, I wouldn't be able to do my job. That's the selfish, most selfish possible way to look at it, but that's the way to, the way to look at it. But also all the other things, you know, I'm not gonna get too stupidly um, corny about it, but it, we're, we have a wonderful situation in our country where you're pretty much free to say whatever you want. So far, I'm beginning to worry about it a little bit. Um, but so far, you're pretty much allowed to say whatever you want, which is the way I think it ought to be. So, yeah, I'm a big, fa- big fan of the First Amendment. That and the one about not having to quarter troops in your house. I don't remember which amendment that is, but I can't number count three. the number of times troops. Have, is it three? OK, there you go. Harvard. But the number of times <laughs> troops have come to my house and asked to be quartered here. And I say, you know, I'm sorry, you know, and I show them the Constitution and they they're yeah. polite about it. Oh, we have the, you know, like because I no, I, I just want to say I don't want to sound anti-troop. If the troops ever need to quarter here, they can quarter here. But only yeah, because but I'm you, letting you're them. Within your you're within your rights to turn them out because, you know, you're clinging to your Third Amendment. And but if any just... troops are watching this, you're welcome. Just so you know, OK, the true I'm saying this to the troops. Yeah, no. So the troops, I hope, heard that message loud and clear um, as they're watching the Freedom Forum's Free Expression Festival. Um, and <laughs> it's a, I hope it's as thrilling for them as it has been for me. So really, I, I, I could keep going for another half hour, but I think this was our time. So thank you so much for joining this program as part of the Freedom Forum's Free Expression Festival. And hooray for the First Amendment. And I'm, I'm with you on, on that, and I think we, we've done a lot here to help it, whatever it was our, we were trying to do. Oh, absolutely. We just talked the subject into the ground, and it's now part of the magma. It's, it's in the core. I haven't studied geology in hundreds of years. It's, it's somewhere. But I just want to say in closing that I, I think everyone can see that there are a lot of books behind you and there are no books behind me. So everybody, hold on. I have a whole bookshelf over there and I happen to pull off this one. It's a book I wrote, but there's book, I have books here in my house also. And if, when the troops come to be quartered, they're welcome to read them. Yeah, there'll be a book for each troop. I'm picturing it just a for the troop. Huge, huge volume of books uh, whose presence is felt even though the limits of Zoom or Vimex call are preventing them from being vi- tangibly visible. But I have books too. That's the point we're making here, right? Yeah. We're getting 
just because no, just because she went to Harvard. Just because yeah, she went to Harvard and has all these books behind her, and I don't, doesn't mean I don't have a lot of books in my house. Also, just getting that out there. Yeah, no, these are actually all the covers are hollow. They're just decorative books. I bought them by the foot. Uh, you can see they're organized by color. There's really there's no content there, and they they look good though. Oh, you gotta have a zoom backdrop. Dave Perry, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Alexandra. Thank you for joining us today. The Free Expression Festival continues tomorrow, featuring a conversation with 2021 Free Expression Award honoree, DeRay McKesson, who talks about his civil rights activism. Please tune in tomorrow at 2 p.m. at freeexpressionawards.org. And you can catch up on all the Free Expression Festival programs by visiting our YouTube channel.